experience, but I don't like the word a lot, experience, experience, you know, because I tend to um, <coughs> think of it as something which has a lot to do with the paranormal, having an experience, and uh, in my investigations now, now um, let's be clear, I'm an amateur, I'm not a Joe Nickel, all right, or a James Randi. Um, so, in fact, it was actually, it's been a, a learning curve, a learning experience as I went along. Okay, I remember. It's been a learning experience in the sense that in the beginning, the, the texts which influenced me, all right, were actually so-called paranormal texts. When you're young, when I was 13, 12 years old, I used to read Eric von Daniken's books, all right, and, you know, um, being sensationalist books, they influence you. You know, I was interested in astronomy also, and so the idea of, you know, having spacemen coming here, you know, interbreeding with people, you know, and building the, the pyramids had a certain, um, uh, you know, had a certain flavor to it. And, uh, but the thing is that, and that's what's really good about books, that you can, you know, read something and it influences you, <coughs> and then you read something else, which, which is basically directly the opposite, direct opposite of what you have just read, and influ it influences you more. And in fact, that's what's, what happened. I read a book by Ronald Story, which was basically a critique of Eric von Daniken's um, Chariots of the Gods, and this guy, you know, poked huge holes in his arguments. And uh, in fact, that's, um, that's the first time that, you know, I, I realized, you know, that um, you have to, I was 12 years old, and you have to really um, think, about what you're, uh, think about what you're reading. Um, and I can say that's my early influence. <coughs> In fact, uh, um, the influences of um, uh, Eric von Daniken and amateur astronomy, and also the sciences, um, uh, spurned me to obviously choose sciences as my oh, A-levels and in fact I wanted to, I remember, I wanted to uh, I always wanted to have a degree in chemistry but unfortunately um, uh, unfortunately it was uh, <laughs> mint of time when uh, you know, there was no time for chemistry, biology or physics at a university level so I had to, have, I had to, t to choose the second best Thing, and I became a laboratory te technologist today, they're called laboratory, sci laboratory scientists. And uh, I worked in the hospital for nine years analyzing blood. I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning this because it has rever <coughs> relevance further on. Um, I also, at the same, at the same time, also uh, <coughs> um, started a course in, journal in journalism with the University of Malta and the London College of, Prin of Printers, got my diploma in journalism, and then I continued and got um, and my degree in communications, journalism, and contemporary design studies. Um, uh, another thing which uh, really influenced me in the 1970s, it was 1976, was the Viking lander on Mars. Okay, for many years, Mars had has always been, um, you know, the planet where you know scientists thought, astronomers thought that um, life may be found there because it was the um, most similar planet to. Um, to the to Earth, you know, it had ice caps. Uh, okay, it has a, it had a thin atmosphere. During that time, they didn't really know how how thin it was. But the Viking lander actually landed on the planet and performed experiments to find to to search for life, which was a first. And up to the up to the, this day, one of the experiments, the pyrol the labeled release experiment, okay, is still okay is still um a bone of contention because many still argue that it this it actually um, gave positive results and the three experiments the three life experiments uh, were were um, regarded as not discovering life on mars because two of them okay two of them were negative and one of the most important one which was supposed to uh, detect uh, 
carbon, uh, carbon atoms or molecules, okay, came, came out negative. And now today there are even there are um, some interesting questions whether it was it was um, sensitive enough to find um, to the those molecules. Um, obviously, Carl Sagan and Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan is important because he fused skepticism with uh, um, the sense of wonder of, of science and astronomy. Uh, you know, he cultivated that sense of wonder, how, how beautiful science is. And remember that in Malta, there's always been that stigma that science is difficult. Science is difficult, it's all formulas, it's all maths, um, you have to be really bright to, to, to study science. And this, unfortunately, and I've been a teacher for 20 years, hasn't changed. Okay? We've been trying, and I even wrote articles about it, we've been trying, okay, to get students more interested in science, and instead, they're becoming less interested in science. Okay? One of the major, the main, one of the major problems is the fact that they don't learn science at an early stage, at, on primary level. Okay, in primary level, it's too difficult. So it's very, it's easy to understand why Virgin Mary is uh, why the, why the Madonna is virgin, but it's very difficult to understand gravity. This I cannot. Um, <laughs> okay, it's easy to understand um, the, the 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 Holy Trinity. Okay, and well, how to put three persons in one, but it's difficult to understand a simple force. Okay, and this has been the problem. And we've been, as usual, we've been discussing it for, for over 25, 30 years. Okay, and still we're so, and with the new science framework, and we're still as far as, away as um, we were 30 years ago. Okay, as I was saying, this guy, Ronald Story, okay, disproved Eric von Daniken's <coughs> um, ideas and actually showed me that, remember at that time Eric von Däniken was, was selling 25 million copies of his uh, um, uh, books. Okay, he even opened a theme park in Switzerland about um, uh, the ancient astronauts' um, uh, theories, you know, he made. And in fact, one of his last books, uh, I think it's called, I forgot its name, but it's actually about Malta, about the Cartrats being some form of um, scratches made by alien spaceships landing gear coming down on Malta, something like that. Um, <clears throat> now, something interesting happened in 1977. Now, remember, 1977 was a very po politically volatile year. There were the teacher strike, there was the doctor strike. You know, it was a very volatile year. And in fact, um, I was lucky because, obviously, being in, in, interested in astronomy, I was also interested in UFOs. And I managed to uh, um, collect all or most of the cuttings that appeared in newspapers. And in fact, I published them on, this, on, on a book. Well, it's a very crude book, which was published in, 19, in the 1990s. Um, I published everything in this book. Um, it's a bit amateurish. But I think it's the only compendium of um, uh, UFO sightings in Malta. And obviously I analyzed them from a skeptical point of view. At this time, I was already, um, I wasn't a believer. I'm interested in UFOs, I'm not a believer. And one of the reasons I analyzed them is, was because they, um, a lot of, uh, they presented a sort of test case, an, in an interesting case. Why, for example, why? Um, where so many UF, um, UFO sightings from, um, seen from July to October 1977. And there's an interesting correlation, where, um, correlation that they actually correlate a lot with a lot of trouble that happened in Malta. And in fact, most of them come from Union Press newspapers and labor-leaning papers. So the, my... my, my um, uh, hypothesis was that basically, you know, they were pushing these uh, UFO uh, um, uh, sightings, you know, uh, to, to mask the problems that, the political problems that there were during that time. In fact, 
Finn Nation and other pro um, pro nationalist newspapers and times, there weren't any there weren't any sightings. And some of them were quite quite spectacular, like the one up there. In fact I, I managed to trace the person over ten years after it was photographed, and it's very strange because sometimes, you know, um, sometimes things come out of the blue. And I managed to trace the person. Um, when I went to, um, f um, to uh, you know, check at Norma Hamilton's uh, <coughs> tour operator out, uh, and I met this man, he told me, look, I, I've seen you talking about UFOs on Sharabang, and I have a story to tell you. And actually, I don't want to divulge any names because he told me, you know, don't. But he told me how actually this was hoaxed, how the whole thing was hoaxed, and it was, in fact, and a nice big page on Torja, actually. It was a nice big page on Torja. Um, and the thing is that I also managed to um, analyze, analyze a number of them. For example, a very interesting uh, one of the one of the UFOs was a very interesting light, which uh, started out very, very, very faint, brightened up, and suddenly um, extinguished on the horizon. And actually, when I checked. Uh, the exact um, time, and I had to go back to the British Astronomical Association handbook and checked the time. I found that it was actually one of the old um, Eco Star satellites, okay, which had exactly the same period of, of um, the same the same period and the same time. It appeared at the same time as this person because the person could told me exactly at what time it had happened, and I could pinpoint it, you know. There were, so, there were a couple of, I can't say that, uh, I can't say that there were about 23 sightings, and none of them, only one is, uh, is uh, uh, quite spectacular. It's, it, uh, actually, it, there was this guy, this guy, I remember, I was in Lapsi. There was a friend of mine who used to work as a barman there in Lapsi, yeah, I, I forgot what it's called, um, the uh, bar there, and told me, look, I, I need to get you to meet someone. I told him, why? In fact, he, worked, he was a colleague of mine at the laboratory. He told me, okay, because this guy's got a story. And uh, this guy came, you know, it was like something out, it was really like something out of X-Files, because this guy came, you know, looking around, the dark, and then start when you, where at that time I, wore, I wasn't so, so, and, you know, I, I didn't know a lot about psychology, but basically he was showing parano paranoid tendencies, this guy. Later on, I, I got to know, but at, at that time, I didn't know, you know, going like this, you know, closing the door, you know, too whiskey, you know. And he told me, I told him, you want to talk? I told him, there isn't any police, oh, yeah, there isn't anyone coming. Police, why? Well, what have you done? Then I got to know that the, actual, the guy actually, um, was caught, maybe, maybe uh, as the older ones, um, more the line. So we remember there was a guy who was caught with two and a half tons of cannabis in, in a boat. No wonder it was <laughs> this guy. <laughs> it was this guy. No, but this guy, it was this guy. And he was, you know, um, a real character. And told me, let's sit down, a double whiskey. Now I don't drink. I have no tolerance for alcohol. No, I have to drink. You know, sit down, drink. I don't know what happened. Told you, of course, I was. At uh, um, uh, what is it called? Bahria. There's a place in Bar Bahria. It's called uh, for Maria. I was what at for Maria. Uh, no, he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't. Um, he wasn't. And and he, he didn't have you know those wide eyes you know and uh, he didn't have any symptoms because I remember his face. This guy actually he he, he died of a heart attack a year later. So um, I think his system couldn't take. And this guy told me that, told me, you know, and this guy told me, I know nothing about flying saucers, I know nothing about your force, you know, nothing, and you, you're already calling them flying saucers, sort of, you know, some, you do know something, you've seen some films, and he told me, what, only a few films, that's all, he told me, I was at for Maria. You know, I told him, what were you? I was still naive. What were you doing there? I told him, you know, oh, no. what were you doing? What? Are you the police? You know, what? Yes. I, I'm sorry, I told him, but he told me, you know, I was doing some business there. So, man, and suddenly, 
I, you know, I had, I still had the car, you know, revving. The car was still revving, and suddenly the car died, and this, he told me, this big plate-like thing, you know, fell down on my car and stopped about two meters above, uh, during that time, five feet, about five, five feet above us, and I, I, and he told me it was like a million bees. In Somali, I couldn't, I couldn't re ignite it again. I couldn't. I, all the lights died down, everything in Soma. And basically, that's the only one. In fact, I didn't, I didn't put it there because the, the, the uh, and this is something, this is, I, I mentioned this because one of the biggest problems when you're talking um, to many of these, these people is that the re reliability, the re reliability of the person who is, okay, um, who had the experience. Now, it's important to realize that um, most of you, I'm sure you do know that our brains are mostly, <coughs> are mostly endorphins, are mostly chemicals, okay? And many, and many of these are hallucinogenic, can be hallucinogenic. And many of them, many of these chemicals, all right, are very easily affected by external stimuli, okay? And today it has been proven that most of, you know, um, out-of-body experiences, um, alien abductions, the old hack syndrome, all of these, which I will be talking about, and I will be talking about some of them, um, all can be, can be <coughs> stimulated, okay? Can be stimulated in the laboratory, okay? So, um, a person who is already, okay, agitated, all right? Uh, that's, that's one of the, that can show you that this person is very highly strung, and there have been also lots of studies which show that people who are highly strung and who are also religious tend to get, tend to have more of these episodes or, or experiences. Okay? Um, but, in fact, I only published one book. Actually, I, I, I wanted to publish a second book, but the second book was much more bizarre because. Um, when I published, I also published the articles on, on, on newspapers, on Times and on Torture, and I got a lot of feedback from other people, and I kept them, and some of the stories are quite interesting. For example, this one, Malta's only um, very close encounter of the fourth kind. It has nothing to do with that uh, soft porn movie um, from Italy of 30 um, years ago. Um, uh, this guy, um, I, this guy, um, he was a charismatic, and uh, he used to go to the uh, Samazon, um, uh, Samazon uh, Garden. It's called El Ginental Minura. You're Tal Majura, man. Melorda. Tal Melorda. This one, even I, I go there a lot and I don't know its name. <laughs> okay? Um, El Ginental Melorda. And he used to go there, and he used to read. He was. He, he was a very strange creature because he used to read, well, actually, he used to read a lot of the Bible and a lot of X Files science fiction UFO literature. Well, um, some of you may say that they're very similar, but, um, but the thing is that this guy used to read them a lot. And uh, he told me, he, he told me, I would like to meet you because at that time also I had a program with Gloria Mitzi, it's called Mimba Adar, and I used to do a small slot on, on, uh, on the paranormal, from a skeptic point of view, I had about 20 minutes, and even there, the amount, the number of people, I've got a couple of uh, interesting people who contacted me there also. Um, and this guy told me, look, because when I come here, when I come here, I get abducted. And slowly you start to, you know, go a bit, you, you start moving away a bit from, from these people, because, um, uh, of, for obvious reasons. I told him, okay, what do you mean abducted, sort of, you know? He told me, because um, I suddenly, I'm reading the Bible, and I suddenly find myself on this spaceship with four angels looking at me, all right? I'm floating, okay? And when I turn my head, below me is the, is the Earth floating in space, and they're all telling me that if the usual Rigamarole, that if we don't repent, you know, whatever was, whatever the said to George Adamski, 
you know, if you don't repent, Earth will be destroyed with nuclear fire, etc., etc., etc. And I noticed, obviously, as I told you, I worked for nine years in the hospital. My wife's a doctor also, so I do have a bit of medical training. And I did know, I noticed, because it was something which affected me too. I noticed that this guy has a has a, a blocked nose, has a, a problem with hay fever. And I told him, I told him, but do you remember? Do you sleep, or um, do you have problems sleeping? You know, he told me um, uh, sometimes. Actually, he told me sometimes I I have the opposite. I I go to sleep and I don't even know why. And uh, in fact, I talked to some people, some uh, um, physicians at St. Luke's where I worked, and they I, he made an appointment, and they they noticed that this guy has most of his nose, his nose, his uh, internal nasal passages are um, closed because of a lot of of growths and um, it can happen and uh, actually what was happening mm -hmm. is that this person was having problems with oxygen supply to his brain and he actually goes to sleep okay because when you have a problem with the oxygen supply to the brain the brain shuts down and to to um so that your um, because it needs a lot of oxygen, okay, it shuts down and goes to sleep, so that it uses up less oxygen. And in fact, what happens also is that a lot of these endorphins are are stimulated because basically it's a it's a it's a traumatic experience, okay, it's a traumatic experience. And this guy started seeing, started having hallucinations, and obviously his hallucinations were fueled with what that he believed in. Angels, because he believed a lot, he was a charismatic, believed a lot in the Bible and all that stuff. And also UFOs, X Files, etc. In fact, when he made, when he he had a small operation where they opened his nasal passages, he he phoned me and told me, "Look, I don't get these uh, blackouts anymore, and I don't get these uh, um, these hallucinations anymore." And he actually accepted that they were hallucinations. The difference between hallucinations and dreams is that hallucinations actually uh, feel that you are in them for real. I they, mean, they, they look not, not look real. I mean, for they, you, I mean, you really yeah, experience yeah. them and you live them through. And I mean, that's the difference between dreams. Dreams, you wake up from them and then you realize they were dreams. And another, the are very real. Yes, that's true. And another thing is that they can be re, they can be reincorporated in your experiences exactly. by another syndrome you called... You call that? Yes. The, uh, the hallucination as a real happening, like... You went abroad somewhere and you had an experience or whatever. It's right? called. There's another syndrome. It's called. Um, it's called Baron Munchausen syndrome. All right, where where basically where basically, um, you have a hallucination or something, and it's so as you said, it's so it's powerful, so real that you incorporate it as part of your reality. Okay, so it's it's basically real, and even when you recall it, you recall it as a, as real. Okay. Which might explain why some, certain people are so passionate about uh, just justifying the, the veracity of uh, their sort of uh, yeah. their, uh, their experiences. Uh, well, we have to also, um, uh, but I'll come to that later on. Uh, something similar also happens in this because I will talk also about my experiences with um, Edward Spiteri, for example. These, uh, I don't know whether something similar happens when they're in these congregations where everyone mass hysteria. where yes where everyone not not only mass hysteria where everyone is basically supporting each other there's a lot of of of, of love there's a lot of love you know what i mean there's a lot of uh, mm -hmm. how, what do you call it uh, camaraderie mm -hmm. not even camaraderie the influence of yeah. the external environment yeah everybody's supportive you know and so that gives you a, yeah. yeah it gives you a sort of everybody's really relaxed they know they they know they've got friends around them so the, 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 and they start, in fact, they even start suffering from hysteria, they suffer from glossolalia, starting and talking in tongues. Um, they start and talk in tongues. There are a lot of, and, and my, although there isn't one theory which encapsulates everything, I, I really think that all of them are connected. They're all basically, they're all basically, they're all basically psych psych psychological phenomena, okay? And uh, 
And another interesting one is, uh, it will appear, is the, the case of the alien peeping toms. <laughs> I received, <laughs> I received once. It's like, I, it sounds like a choreography movie. Yeah, but, and <laughs> there was this, this okay. woman who phoned me and told me, All right, fine. look, I'm going crazy. And the interesting, what's, what's really worrying is that the person was really worried. It really wasn't a joke. She was really, and this, this makes you feel a bit uncomfortable because yeah, you want to laugh because of the situation, but at the same time you can't laugh because you know it's the person is going to a trauma, yes. And she told me because I was having a bath, I was having a bath, and suddenly this um, look at this this sausage like sausage like spacecraft. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With a lot of portholes, had these. Uh, okay, make it. Okay. Right. Had these gray, this gray, you know, usual gray man with these slit like eyes, you know, we see in X Files, looking at me. And the only thing I can do, I've got. A, um, I know, um, Doctor Vella Baldacchino, who's quite psychiatrist and who's quite a septic and usually I told them I'm going to send you some uh, business your way okay and I I send them and I tell them you know talk talk to him and um, because usually you can uh, you can be given some epilene unfortunately I've got a I've got a, a 17 year old kid who suffers um, from a number of mental illnesses and so I'm very 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 um, familiar with different types of medications um, of psychotropic medications, and they give they give her a dose of epilene, for example, so the invalpirate, and suddenly the hallucinations go go. I know how what this is because once my kid came and told me, Dad, God is talking to me, and you can laugh, don't worry, because it's a funny situation. And my kid told me, God is talking. I told him, Look, don't let him go because I have I have to give him a piece of my mind. <laughs> and and I know, this is true. Ask my wife. I know that. And suddenly I told my wife, I told me, she phoned Dr. Anton Greg, he told her, let's give him a couple of epilene. After taking epilene, starting to take epilene, he didn't connect, contact God anymore. So that solved it. And no, to see the, how eff efficacious, you know, how, how effective this treatment is. And I can see it firsthand there, eh? how effective this treatment is. Okay? If, if my, my kid wasn't treated this way, he would be, you know, in, in, uh, oh, in the psychiatric unit or in Mount Carmel today, yeah? Because he had more than one. Yeah, interesting, another one, an interesting one is the glowing haystacks. Now, this is interesting because it shows that how, that, that we can confuse a normal phenomenon, a normal mm -hmm. physical or, or, or scientific phenomenon, okay, with a, an invented, oh, oh, paranormal one. I, I had a friend of mine who told, uh, who, whose dad had a farm at Matap. In fact, actually, I used to teach this kid in Savio College. And he told me, look, he told me, my, my, my dad is very, is a bit afraid because he's seeing, um, he's seeing um, these sort of um, bluish ghosts. And also, like um, uh, balls of bluish light. They're like UFOs. And... Uh, and on reading, I follow a lot um, uh, Joe Nickel, who's a paranormal investigator. He's a skeptic, a big skeptic, but he did a lot of work um, uh, in books like uh, Looking for a Miracle. And also James Randi, who's got loads of books about these, um, about these uh, phenomena. And one thing you need to do first is obviously to go on the ground and see what, what's happening there. And the, the interesting is that Quickly, quickly, I could, I could got now. I'm trained in, in chemistry, so I, 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 you know, realized when I went there that he had a lot of these, you know, these um, round haystacks, you know, and they were, they were giving off a very, a very, a very um, pungent smell. Actually, when we, when I took a sample, it turned out to be phosphine. It turned out to be phosphine which is pH 3. It's like ammonia, but ammonia has a nitrogen in H3. Phosphine has a pH 3. And it's a very unstable gas, very, very, 
very unstable, very flammable, okay? And also, it, uh, um, it, uh, its flame is very, very ethereal. It's like, it's like a bluish, a bluish, um, uh, horror, horror-like flame. It's, it's very strange when, you know, it's, uh, it's very strange. It's like almost, almost phosphorescent. Mm, almost phosphorescent. And in fact, we had gone, we went there, we went there um, during the night, and we actually saw these uh, balls. Now, during this, remember, this was the time when there weren't um, digital cameras so widely available that they are, you know, like today. Okay, so uh, obviously I have no, but there was this guy with me, so he, he can prove it. It was similar to what is being seen here. Um, here. Yes, in Malta, yes. Malta. Malta. Uh, Malta, yes. What happened is that it had rained. It had rained, and it and the uh, the the straw was was decomposing, and because they're so compressed, the phosphine was 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 trapped inside. It was trapped inside. So when it came out, and I told them, be careful because it's extremely poisonous. In fact, we even told um, the health department about it and. You know, they came and helped him clean everything. But, but I'm telling you, eh, these balls of light, they're very similar to ball lightning. And, uh, you know, they, when, you, when you see them, you say, it's ghastly. Yeah. yeah, it's ghastly, that's the word. You know, you say, look, there's something there. But that's a, another interesting uh, was the, uh, in fact, I could, I, I've got, I've got photos of this, photos. but I couldn't. I've got photos, but it was, they were crop circles in an onion field. Crop circles in an onion field. Yes, in an onion field. In 1992. And I know the guy who, who took the photographs, but then we realized that the crop circles, um, um, and even, even the, um, the onions, the, the onion stalks were, were, uh, were of different heights. But it was different from crop circles abroad where where the the corn or the uh, <coughs> the corn is basically um, flattened but flattened at an angle because usually when they make these uh, when they make these uh, crop circles they use sp um, special um, pieces of ro of, of uh, wood and they go like this with their feet on, on the wood um, to make the crop circles and uh, they were they were and actually it turned out that the, the circular patches had formed okay because um, the soil was unevenly fertilized we took some samples for nitrates and it turned out that it was unevenly fertilized and um, uh, but they did look they did look like small crop circles from from because he took them from uh, um, had a friend in the Fort Sierra Martin they took a photograph from from the helicopter now some, one of the most interesting um, sightings, not sighting, one of the old experiences, came from this guy, and he was a very old man. Now, today he, he's dead because when I talked to him about 15 years ago, he was uh, already about almost 90 years old. And uh, it, it was a sweet encounter because this guy told me how he was uh, from Mostar, not very far from where I live. It was old fields, and he told me he used to go and, uh, <coughs> you know, take his goats there. And once he was going to sit down and uh, eat, eat some, you know, some hops with zeit, some um, bread. <coughs> and uh, suddenly he saw this tiny, small woman, that big, you know, flying around. And it was interesting because this guy was totally, he told me, I know, he was quite a tough guy. You know, a couple of swear words, I'm born. I know you're not going to believe me, you know. I don't know, I didn't even open my mouth, sort of. Come on, tell me. He told me, but I saw her, and then, and she was so small, she was so beautiful, you know. And which sheds doubt on whatever he was doing, whether he was eating or doing something else. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, or running after a goat or something. Um, uh, uh, um, and he 
He told me, and it was so beautiful, and suddenly it flew off and went into a rubble wall. Went into a rubble wall. And he told me, I, I demolished the whole rubble wall to find her, and I didn't, and I didn't find her. Well, um, you know, I told him interesting stories also, but, you know, make up your minds what he <laughs> was saying. <laughs> now, well, a very interesting experiment. It was the first time I appeared on Sharabank with a friend of mine. We, I remember we, we, we uh, it was the first time it discussed um, your foes. And what we did is that we, we had this uh, hubcap. What's Little green men. Was it? Oh yeah. <laughs> we grabbed this hub cup, you know, and we painted don't, it. Don't ask what he was always. <laughs> <laughs> painted it with uh, some silverine, okay? And we uh, <clears throat> had a, a very long line from one side of the valley to another. We put the uh, hubcap on a, on a, what do you call it? On a, it was a sort of, a, a sort of hook. And my friend, Lori, went up on the other side, you know, grabbed the line, okay? And, you know, placed it up for about a meter and the, <laughs> the hub cup started moving, and uh, and we did it. We did it when when Sharabank was airing. I remember, and suddenly, you know, they started getting phone calls, you know, on something silvery, round and silvery over the valley. Okay, and we had done it. We, we did that on purpose to show how easy it is, you know, to uh, um, <laughs> um, hoax a uh, UFO sighting. In fact, I had done it also when I was teaching at Savio College. I had done this. Uh, um, now remember, this is in, in 1992, which was before um, so many digital cameras were available. Okay, so these kids, I had done, I had uh, prepared this uh, UFO hoax competition because I used to teach them science and I was taught, we were um, talking about um, hoaxing and falsities in science. And I told them, let's do this competition. I, I remember I also had an, um, an astronomy group there, the Copernicus Club. And I told them, let's do this. Who makes the best hoax, all right, gets a book prize. And in fact, they did some really good stuff. Now we're talking about um, 12 to 14 year old kids. So imagine someone who has, you know, who really knows Photoshop, who really knows how to take photos, What's such a person can do? In fact, today, even when we look at YouTube and they tell you it's full of UFOs flying around, you know, YouTube. Today, the problem is that if they're really good, they most certainly are hoaxes. That is the problem now. Before, you know, they used to get, take a lampshade, you know, George Adam's, spa Adam's spacecraft. It was obvious that it was a lampshade. It even, it even had the, the bulb holder in the middle. Come on. It's obvious. Today, they're so good, and even, you know, there are, I, I'm sure there are some computer people out that, here that you can do real, you can do good CGI work on a, on a, on a computer. Okay? For example, you can remove the Last, last, a few days ago, I was looking, because I'm interested also in cryptozoology, which is the science of lost animals, and there was this, these guys who got a, uh, a film of a thylacine, which is supposed to be an extinct marsupial tiger in Tasmania. And it was a fantastic film of a thylacine. And then, obviously, I said, this is too good to be true. And suddenly I went and checked and found that it was actually a part of a film, The Hunter, part of a film, okay, which they had, uh, you know, taken to, to prove that they exist, you know, so hoax, hoaxes, even these Bigfoot films and all this <coughs> stuff, if they're really good, okay, they're hoaxed. In fact, most of them are very, very poor. It's like these guys who say that when Curiosity lands on, landed on Mars, suddenly they started seeing a lot of UFOs. And either I know 
I'm not, my eyesight is not very good, but come off it. You're telling me that on this photo there's, there are UFOs. Where the hell are they? Why can't I see them? It's all the same. All these sites on the internet, anomalies on the moon, anomalies on Titan, anomalies on Jupiter. Well, why can't I see them? Or is my eyesight so bad? Because basically they're using, they're, 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 they are, there's a phenomenon called pareidolia, where the, where the brain has a tendency to make shapes out of haphazard um, um, patterns. patterns. Okay? Like the face on Mars? Yeah, like the face on Mars, okay? Which, which now has been obviously disproven because it's a mesa, it's a mesa, or a mesa, or whatever. It's, a, it's a, um, an elevated plane, plane, eroded plane. And now the Mars Reconnaissance spacecraft, which can basically, um, which basically has a, a sensitivity of about one, one foot. Can basically has basically taken a very detailed photograph of it that can be found on the internet. Can be seen on the internet. Now, another interesting. On the other, is the Malt Atlantis theory. I was also this uh, interested interested me because I actually know Dr. Anton Mifsud. I know him, the uh, pediatrician who pushed this theory a lot. We used to work together and. <laughs> And uh, in fact, he invited me to about two or three seminars, which he did, which were bloody hell full of, of cooks and, and, and disturbed people who could communicate with what unicorns, whatever, with everything. It was, and I told them, I told them this really damaged. It wasn't the theory as such. Okay, the theory there, it's full of holes also. But you know, it's not that far out, huh? But the fact that you did two seminars, and these seminars, one of them was advertised by Heritage Malta. Eh? Now, you know, half of these people would end up in, in Mount Carmel, as you hear, yeah? Half of the people taking part there. One of them could, 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 one of them, um, could understand the music of the spheres and, and, and uh, oh, play it on the harp. And if you listen to it, it makes no sense what she's playing. And you, well, I'm sorry, it was totally crazy. Um, th this um, Anton's uh, thesis is that basically, okay, Malta's the remnant of the continent, uh, of the landmass of Atlantis, which has been placed in about eight different localities. And uh, and he even wrote a book, Echo, Echo, Echoes of Plato's Island. And uh, the evidence is very, very flimsy. Um, for example, how can you have such an enormous, Atlantis is said to have been destroyed by an enormous um, volcanic explosion. How can you have an enormous volcanic explosion in, on an island which is basically sedimentary? There are no volcanic rocks here. The only volcanic rocks which have been found, okay, were were found in Malta by by erosion of the sea. They came from Sicily, and we can date them. We can we can do stratig stratigraphic analysis on them. Everything we know exactly how. There is there is the, Malta. Malta cannot have any volcanism. It can't have volcanism. A volcano can't penetrate through Malta for the sim simple reason. That Malta is a mass of five sedimentary layers, which basically rest on the Eurasian continental plate. Okay, and usually when volcanoes erupt, they try they always erupt from the thinnest part of the continental plate. And actually, the fact we're lucky because the fact that we've got so many hundreds of meters of sedimentary rock, okay, cushioning us, protects us from volcanoes and from earthquakes. It's very difficult to have an earthquake with an epicenter, not difficult, it's impossible to have an earthquake with an epicenter directly underneath Malta. It has to be very deep down. And the deeper it is, the less destructive it is. Okay, because, uh, because the shock waves um, lose energy when they go towards the surface. Uh, and uh, other, 
another uh, evidence is evidence of Paleolithic in Malta. Now, um, mainstream archaeology, and I do also, uh, I want to be f clear that sometimes there is a tendency for science to be a bit orthodox. Also, science has that tendency, but fortunately, that tendency, all right, is a safe valve, which usually, all right, keeps out the more shitty ideas. Okay, the more garbage ideas. Okay, so, um, and I'm not that against the fact that in Malta there could have been a Paleolithic culture. Why? Because you, it's very difficult to find evidence of a Paleolithic culture. Because obviously they use rocks, and if the if the if the rocks are lost, and they usually use rocks, um, which were you know they didn't they rarely shaped rocks or very rarely shaped rocks, so they used rocks as they were. And even if they shaped rocks, okay, most of these rocks are probably eroded or somewhere. So it's very difficult to find. But it's not impossible that instead of having any any Neolithic culture coming to Malta. 7,000 years ago, 9,000 years ago, Paleolithic people came here. The problem is that the lack of evidence. Because there is actually, and this tooth, this Taurodont tooth, can be found at the Ardalam Museum. Okay? The Taurodont tooth, okay, was seen as proof that there were Paleolithic here in Malta. Why? Because a, a Neanderthal tooth was found. But actually, later on, it was found that it is atavistic. Okay? That a lot of and a lot of normal people can have, okay, similar teeth. Okay, why? Because we still have, we still have part of our genetic structure, okay, derived from the Neanderthal genetic structure, okay, because uh, they probably interbred, okay, they probably they came from the same, or right, from the same <coughs> original ancestor. Okay, so basically we have similar genetic structures, just like we have similar, very similar genetic structures with chimpanzees. 99.5% of, of a man and, and uh, chimps genetic structure is identical. There is a big chance that if, you could, if we could fertilize okay, an ovum of a chimp with a, with a sperm, that it would take. And there is an equally big, big chance that it could, it could, Okay, grow up to be fertile, not infertile. That's how close we are. Closer than, than, than uh, horses and, and donkeys. Okay? Um, the thing is that things, okay, things started becoming really, really uh, far out when Dr. Mifsud made contact with this guy, Dr. Hubel, Hubert Zeltmer, who's a big promo, pro, proponent of a guy called Zakaria Sitchin, whose books would actually, these books about Niburu, actually put Eric von Dannekins to shame, eh? because he talks about the 12th planet, which comes to, well, I could only read the first book. All right? And, you know, a proponent of Zakaria Sitchin's Niburu, Atlantean Cold Fire Future, powerhouse in Malta that still generates, this is their website, non-lethal, high-frequency, active auroral energy. Maybe that's why we're so messed up here. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, that's All right? Okay. No. It's, everything can be found in www.discovery.org. Those were, that was a, a photo of the evidence of the subterranean um, temples. When there is, I'm not saying there can't be subterranean temples, why? Because, for example, we know that um, uh, Birza Buja, where there, where uh, a Borchinadu, you know, where the guy sees a lot of hallucinations, um, Borchinadu, we know that the uh, carts that's in Borchinadu go down into the sea and basically cross to the other side. Yes, they do. The car there. Just to the no, no, Le, la, le fresco. Le, la, the, ma, ma, the other side, the. Uh, the face, the man, la fresco. Ma where do they go? They come to the Moru, the boat from Bahar. I don't know if they come. 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 
um, a more full vote. And the thing is that actually Malta in 7,000 years or 6,000 years, all right, sank by 2.5 meters on that side. Okay, so you know maybe there was a a temple somewhere, and you know that part of the land sank. It's not something beyond. Okay. Other miscellaneous stuff. Interesting. Um, this is a interesting the one about the icon that cried two tears of blood because I investigated this quite quite um, thoroughly because obviously my my job during that time was was analyzing blood. Okay, and uh, what's interesting also that I was um, one of the uh, I was uh, <coughs> invited to Piazza Atleta by Lubondi. And in fact, it, it was the first time uh, Lubondi, who obviously, like every other um, person who you know, has a program, wants to make his program sensationalist, the first thing he asked me was whether I believe or not. And in fact, it was the first time that I had said that I was an atheist. And that was a big mistake on my part. Okay? But not only on my part, because then I, I actually had a big fight with him, because it basically. Um, derailed the argument of the whole um, program. It wasn't whether I'm an atheist or not. It was about evidence. It was about evidence. In fact, I remember I had, read, I had written an article, and I want to, an analysis of an alleged bleeding Maltese Madonna by David Patch. This, is, this was published on our um, magazine on Psychics magazine and uh, the Beacon. Uh, in my opinion, the most important point to emerge was the way the icon was removed so quickly from the Church of St. Dominic. Because let me tell you the story in short. The thing is that um, there, was a, there was this woman, you know, praying in the church, and suddenly she saw these two um, tears of blood, blood on, on the Madonna's face. And there was another priest who came up and uh, wiped them, the first two. Okay, the first two were wiped. Then, according to them, she, she cried another two. Now, my, my thesis is that someone pricked his finger, all right, and placed his finger beneath the eye. Huh? The, first were, the first two were wiped, but somebody else then, I think it was pious fraud. That was my... Probably it was the priest. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is this. You could never know. Remember that the guy who took care of that was the Maltese Archbishop. Now, he was the uh, El Periola. What do you call him? I, will, uh, oh, the man, I don't know what they call him. Cremona. Cremona, Cremona, Cremona. Cremona. Paul Cremona was the head of the congregation of whatever they were. I'm not very... Um, with them. Um, actually, the f it was a big mistake, basically, taking it out of its place. You are tampering with the evidence. That's, that's the first no-no. The sci scientific method requires that if the reality of a new phenomena or force is to be tested, this must be done in situ without changing the conditions under which the phenomena, phenomenon or force were originally observed. Once the conditions are altered, the original investigation cannot be repeated. And repeatability is one of the uh, pillars of science. And one of the basic tenets of scientific method changed, namely that of repeatability. In simpler terms, as soon as the religious icon was removed from its original place, it became impossible to examine how the blood-like liquid appeared beneath its eyes. This another thing I suggested, not that simple, but I suggested that they analyzed the blood, in fact they did analyze it, and they found that it was human blood. Because a friend of mine, Christopher Farrugia, he's with the forensic unit, and he analyzed it. And, but, they, I, I also suggested that all, and this is very expensive, and not only expensive, it would uncover what happened. I suggested that everybody, okay, everybody, all the priests, have a DNA test. And there was enough blood for a DNA testing because you just need a very, very small amount. 
And obviously, there was another priest, I forgot his name, but he was from the theology department. He used to teach um, dogma. And this guy, every time I talked, he became red in face. You know, really angry. Dana, he became really angry. Not, not a guy you could actually talk to. Um, so, uh, obviously, at the end, they did this televoting, and 80% uh, came out that they and accepted that it's true, and 20% said that it's not true. It's true. <laughs> that, that it happened. Yeah. That it really happened. You know, it was really, really a uh, miracle. 80% agreed. The DNA testing was done? Of course not. No. They didn't want to catch the, the person who. They didn't want to catch him who. And I, I suspect they knew who it was. They knew who it was. Well, Another guy who I've, I've had the dubious honor being on Sharbank about twice and also meeting him in smart supermarket um, is Edward Spideri, whom uh, um, the healing guy, this I think explains a lot, TV preacher evades questions on public donations, I think um, that explains a lot. This guy who most of you have probably seen him on Smash TV. Yeah. Not the really crazy one, Gordon John. Gordon Go, Not that one, no. This guy is more, is cooler, more mellow. Yeah, this yeah. One, yes. Edward Spideri. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gordon John, far out. But this one is mellow. Yeah, he's mellow. The other one, he's got crazy eyes, you know. Yeah, that the, 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 the other one is fraud written all over. Yeah. And well, even, this one, even his eyes and mouth. Well, but this guy is worse, eh? This one is worse because he's more He's the pure he's charlatan. He's the pure charlatan. This guy has a. I don't want to look. I hate, you know, um, offending people um, when they're not here because yeah, I had a lot of. Yeah. If you debate him on Sharabank, you'll probably start crying. No, no, he, I debated him on, on Sharabank and he told me I, I was really. Before going on Sharabank, he told me, I'm so afraid. I thought, why are you afraid? Why should, should you be afraid? You know, if you've got contact with God, God is your witness or whatever, your protector. I told him, you shouldn't be afraid. I told him, I told him, if you're right, you shouldn't be afraid. And, uh, and even the fact that when he sees me, he's very chummy chummy, that, that sets, sets um, uh, alarm bells in my head when someone like him is chummy with me. Because he shouldn't be. So, oh, hello, how are you doing that? You know, all that. No, it's with me, it's from our people. Kind. You know, so it's, uh, um, uh, but this guy has a whole history of charlatanism. He was a businessman who said, but the thing is, the really good thing is this, that he's got a really strong following of about, and when they meet at Hyperion Hotel, they, they usually have between three and 5,000 people. Eh? 5,000? Yes. It's, I've, I've been there. It would literally be a political power. <laughs> it's really, he's really popular. And basically he uses the usual psychosomatic tricks where, you know, you, you, we've never seen anybody with half a leg grow a leg and run away, you know. But people who have headaches, you know, backaches, it's psychosomatic, you know. You, they start praying, start singing, get a bit of glossolalia, glossolalia, speaking with tongue. And then they touch them on the head and they slam on the ground, which is mass hysteria, okay? And uh, they, they do a couple of antics like that. So, sometimes he even um, exorcises people. Um, I've seen him exorcise a person um, in, uh, at the Salesiani, Slima, which for me, and I know I knew I used to teach the, the priest there, Father Eric. In fact, I told him a couple of words. So you know, he asked for it. You let this guy do that on him, because this this guy was probably disturbed. He had some kind of, okay, even the way, uh, the person he wasn't. You know, I didn't have the devil in him. He was probably either a, a schizophrenic or whatever. You know, I thought, why, why why are you doing that to him? You know, it was a, a total farce. In fact, even the church, because the church, um, only. The church can do these things. He can't. Um, but um, he was actually because but he used to do, the church. yes, because he used to meet people in halls, in church halls. No, they don't do so, service like that. Charismatics do them. I've known no, my no, friend no. Pierre Fennec, no. who's a, an atheist. 
he's married to a charismatic, and they've, they've tried to get the oh, devil out of him for about 39 times. <laughs> <laughs> and he always ends up laughing. It's fun. It's great fun. That's why I go. It's really great fun. He starts laughing. You know, every time, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just break up. play a monster for free. Yeah, yeah, you know. And this guy is, you know, very laid back person. And so on. And, uh, and for example, when he's, got, when he's got a birthday, or one of his kids has a... Uh, um, a birthday, you know, he gets about two, three thousand presents. And they do, they have, it's not, it's good to be, you know, God's voice. Uh, it's profitable, oh. And I've known people, and people have told me that even checks have changed hands. Okay? Checks have changed. The worst thing which I hated on Sharabang was the fact that there was a guy sitting near me who had a uh, prostate cancer, and this is something which I really hate. And this guy said, um, uh, all right, all right, all right. Oh, this, this guy said, um, it was a, an operation with, which took five hours. A prostate operation is, is an operation where, where they hollow out the prostate to get all the cancer out. And usually it's quite successful, okay? But it takes about five hours, because you have to be careful to get out all the stuff. Because if you leave a bit, the cancer, you know, it grows again. And suddenly this boy, you know, it was fun, told me, before he went under, Edward put his hand on his head. And said, and, and he healed him, and then bloody hell. Prof Scott I uh, spent five bloody hours <laughs> hacking away. And this guy, by putting his hand on his head, he hit him. You know, give credit. You know. I was dismayed to read in hospital. Yeah, but right. I'm always dismayed reading him. God's hand guided his surgery. Uh, now, first, he became the vulnerable by the politician. Now he's the, he's the holy politician. I've known lots of people who have become suddenly holy because they're so ashamed of what they did. So come on, let's not. That's another argument. Eh, interesting. Well, I had some run-ins with the spirit mediums. Yoda's very interesting. Yoda is uh, one of these Bormla, Bormla, Bormla girls, with go Bormla girls with yellow hair, all chpa, chpa, oh, gold, Chpiepedek, Dano, Bormla, Dano, a bruiser, Dano, um, sort of people. Yoda, Yoda's more cunning than her. And I once went, and the thing is this that when you go to a fortune teller, you mustn't tell them anything. And I, well, I, go, I went to a fortune teller so that she tells me things about myself which I don't know. And I was, she was, I sat down. And she told me, she started talking and asking me questions. I started going, yes, no, yes, no, le, Eva, le, Eva, le. Hey, wait, there was a teenage Ahaja. Aren't you going to give me something? I don't blood hell, I came here so that you can give me something. I'm going to, I'm going to bloody pay you. And she didn't get one thing right. <laughs> and she told me, she told me, eight pounds. She liet does the eight pounds. No man, I hope did did I put in. <laughs> you know, this sort of swearing which you hear where? At the ground, the football ground out. In my swearing and I ran out, eh? I'm telling you. I really ran out fast. How old? So, and also I appeared with these guys, with these women on, on Sharabank, and this is one thing I, I hate. When they appear on Sharabank, they get more business. Mm. That's right. And in fact, I'm not appearing on Sharabanka, but that's also because of certain problems with, 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 um, with Peppy. And I think, interesting. Now, look how easy, not how easy, look sometimes how these two, these two here, 
the young boy and the poltergeist and the haunted, haunted warehouse. There are, there are very interesting uh, investigations which show how easy it is to be hoodwinked. I had a friend who had a porcelain shop. He had lots of porcelain, you know. And told me, Dave, I'm going bloody crazy. Every time, every day, and it was quite, quite expensive porcelain. Every day, one, one statue explodes. One statue explodes. And, you know, he wasn't the person who was. He used to show me the bits. He is not going to, you know, break them, <laughs> break them or anything. Dave, he told me I'm going crazy. And I told him, let me come and see your shop. And I noticed this little boy, you know, a really bored little boy, about five years old, on the ground playing, you know. And I told him, look, can you, can you hide the camera? And pointed at your boy. I told him, because you told me that your boy is always here, playing. I told him, okay, no, I, I don't mind you suspecting him. I, I'm not suspecting anything. But there doesn't seem to be anything wrong here. The only viable is him. So let's take a look at him and see what comes up. Uh, this is something which, you know, Joe Nickel and the others do. It's not something which I invented, you know. Sort of check on what is on the, on the viable. You know, you have to... And... And it was interesting because when we saw the footage, when his father or his mother weren't looking, the kid was flicking something. Mm. And suddenly, boom, a statue explodes. <laughs> and I told him, look, have you got something small and heavy? He told me, yes, my lead shot, because he was a, a hunter. He told me, my lead shot. Mm. This guy, you know, just because he was bloody bored, this kid was was, and you know, he had, he had, it was carpeted, so that if something falls, you know, it's, it was carpeted. So he was flicking this thick lead shot, boom, and when it hits a, a statue or a plate or a cup, boom, it explodes. Okay, and they were thinking, you know, they were going crazy, they weren't believers, it is some kind of ghost or poltergeist or whatever, he's flicking it like that and like that, and when the lead shot falls, it's, you can't you can't find it on the on the on the carpet because it's too thick. In fact, when then we then we started looking for them, you know, and found them between the hairs, mm. you know. And so how is how easy it is to be duped? This was a five-year-old kid. The other one, the haunted warehouse, is, is also interesting. There was this guy. Even I got a bit. I I scratched my head a bit. He told me every time at eleven. This was a big warehouse in Orme. Every time at 11, it's as if a whole group of chainmail clad um, knights, you know, are, are, are marching through, through my warehouse. He told me, come and listen to them. I thought, this is interesting, let's go. And, shoom, 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 uh, really, really, I told him, what the hell is happening here? Uh, you know, really, it's like, like you know, chainmail people marching. And, I started looking around, you know, the warehouse, and suddenly, on the other side, um, a, uh, a lift caught my eye. There was a, a guy who was who was disabled, who, who had a lift installed in his uh, in his house, and this guy was. It, it, it turned out that this guy was was a telephone operator, and, and he worked shifts, and he started at eleven. I said, "There's a, there's a connection uh, here." And then I th I thought we went to this guy, I told him, can we look in your shaft, your, your, your shaft? Mm -hmm. And we found out that the shaft, there's a, there was a, um, a broken pipe, katusa, in his shaft, which ran all through, all through the warehouse, outside, opposite the warehouse. Actually, it took the overflow from his roof. I don't know why they, did, they made it that way, but I think it's something old. They didn't change it. And what was happening is that the mechanism of the of the lift was being modulated through the because the pipe was broken through the the, the hole in the pipe, and it, it just sounded it like, like a lot of yes, it sounded like mm. like like <coughs> chainmail knights. Let me see how much. Uh, all right, we're almost there. <laughs> um, well, the violent ghost is nothing special. There was this this. A friend of mine who told me once that, no, to, to, um, told me that nobody can stay in his house. Now, I'm not a particularly brave person, but 
for me, ghosts, vampires, and are so stupid that I don't even, I, you know, I think the worst, uh, your worst enemies are living people, not <laughs> dead people, <laughs> especially if they've got a shotgun or something. Um, <clears throat> but, but he said he had a violent ghost. And the fact that even, uh, for, uh, for a few days, it even made newspaper news, you know, in the media. And, uh, and uh, I told him, he told me, he contacted a psychic and he told me, uh, me he contacted actually. Um, I told him, because you're from psychic, can you come can you and see him? See what? what? He told me, I told him I'll sleep there, you know, sort of. I don't know. And so that's what I did. Uh, I took my sleeping bag and slept there and nothing happened, not even. In fact, it was one of the best um, you know, because I, you know, I, I, they weren't my kids, so it was one of the best, um, most relaxing um, rests I ever had, actually, this one. And the last one is room 24 in Atlantis. This was supposed to be Atlantis Hotel. It's a hotel in Marsal, Marsal 4. It's supposed, room 24 is supposed to be haunted. A couple of friends of mine told me that they, they, um, were using their towels, and then they placed their towels on, on you know, on the on the towel rack, and they 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 suddenly came back and found the towel, you know, um, uh, found the ta towel. Uh, how do you say it? Um, not on the floor, no, because um, folded, folded, found the towel folded, folded on the other towels, and not even, and also, um, not even damp. And I said, okay, let's go there and see what happens. And nothing happened. Okay? Well, I'm not going to uh, um, uh, pass any judgment because I don't like to pass judgment, but nothing happened. It's uh, either skeptics, um, um, ghosts hate skeptics, or, okay, that's one of the theories. Or I'm afraid. All right? I used, listen, I used to go there very often. You probably ended up in this room also, which really, probably, uh, exactly. One last thing is something which happened to me. It's called the uh, um, old hack syndrome. This is important because it really opened my eyes. Well, I used to, I remember when my wife was worked um, in the hospital um, uh, shift, I used to be alone and they didn't have any kids and I used to be alone. And uh, I had problems with my, with my sinuses. And twice, I had two very frightening experiences. And I was really lucky because I was, before I was reading, I was reading about alien abductions. Mm. And they had, they had connected sleep apnea and sleep disorders mm -hmm. with UFO uh, abduction experiences. Mm -hmm. And it's very frightening because what happened is that I was going to sleep and suddenly, okay, I was paralyzed, I couldn't move, I heard footsteps, I heard footsteps, I couldn't move, I couldn't even move my head like that to see who was, I heard footsteps, I felt the bed move as if someone was coming, you know, on it, then somebody, ter you know, turned on me and started, started um, breathing in my face. Okay, and I couldn't move, and it was a terrifying experience because you're you're paralyzed. And then, as so as as quick as it as as quick as it happened, it left. And suddenly, you start moving. You get up, and nothing's changed. That was the first. This happened to me twice. Another one, and then I'll open for discussion. Another one was when I had 105 temperature. I remember clearly my wife, you know, taking care of me. And suddenly, the room turned red, and a lot of small demons started running around. <laughs> and I started laughing. <laughs> because I, it was so funny. Small, you know, these demons with pitchforks. You know, running around, you know, busy, you know, come on. The, like the, and she said, what the hell are you laughing? It's full of devils at the light. Maybe she's yarding home or how you let her. I how about You're hallucinating. I was hallucinating, okay, and... Uh, but you, you realized? Yes, I realized even in the hallucination. <laughs> I, and even, that's why I was... You were, you were, you were, you were, you were, you were 
But even, once, even the old hag, old. even the old hag, I wasn't totally terrified because I had read about it a few days. The old hag is the hadila. Hadila, hadila. Did you know what it's all, it's all about? It's basically, okay, like lack of oxygen, of oxygen to oxygen. the brain, mm -hmm. endorphins start firing, mm -hmm. and you have hallucinations. Is this caused by emotions? <coughs> Eh? No, no, no. 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 Because it's very because similar. Because it happened to me when my father died. But usually. It happens to everyone. And it, ha and it happens also no. according to their mythologies. Mm. Sometimes it's old hag, it's an old woman, it may be an old man, depends on your, your preference. <laughs> um, all right. Um, it could be an animal, also on preference. Um, <laughs> uh, anything. No, but, but for example. In Indian lore, it's the money too. For example, in Hindu, also they have a similar. Uh, basically, they used to think that they were these. They used to think that it was what they were called these female devils. You know, um, you know, um, Christocubus. You know, the Christian, the Christian um, of, of obsession with um, sinful females. You know, Lilith, and basically, Lilith, this was Lilith, the Lilith, embodiment of the sinful female according to the skewed Christian theology. Basically, you know, the succubus. Well, any questions, comments, observations? I remember when I had hallucinations that I had fever. I was about 11 years old. And there was the cockroaches that left. It's fine, but it's not. And it's going to end start working on the, on the wall. And uh, there was my sister. I told her to kill it. Kill it. And she started laughing at me. And, and I had a, a cup, and I took her. <coughs> Take it seriously. Okay. And my mother, I remember, came. And she told me, Why are you seeing the cup? She said, I'm seeing it on the wall. It's very near. And she had a, a broom. And she did it. And I saw the cockroach going down, yeah. and then I told it, bring a scoop, and I saw it, saw it on the scoop, and went, it carried on, what one, my mother was, it's incredible. Oh, in Malta there are ghost uh, stories about faces on the wall. It's incredible, it's not... And people have thrown, so, have thrown the uh, old people you used know, to have. Here you, are. you know what I mean? Yes, I know. People the, 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 the carried on, what my mother was doing. Was yeah. Old people used to have. What do you call it? Oh, the barney, oh, the, 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 the bucket for, you know, so that they don't go to toilets. It's slow. It's and slow. many of them, I've known instances where they, they actually, you know, threw the slop on top of the... Uh, because they've seen a face there. And there are some, some houses which are characterized, characterized by these faces which appear on the, on the wall. Actually, it appeared once. You mean faces, not faces? Faces. Faces with faces. But the faces fall back on your face. <laughs> faces with faces, actually. But, but the thing is that it, it happened once by hallucination to someone, and suddenly it's the house with the face. You know? It's become the house with the face. Um, once, when I was much younger, when I was around 12, I was in the scouts, and one of our activities was, was the night hike. Oh, yeah. Where we would spend the entire night, uh, right until the next morning, walking. And I remember on one occasion we had to walk until to the campsite and uh, end up sleeping there in the day. And I think it was around about 4 a.m. So everyone was quite sleepy, you know, all the conversation had died down. We were sort of wandering around. And we were passing through a very uh, dark place uh, with trees. When all of a sudden we came into a clearing and we see this white shape sort of floating in midair and murmuring it sounded like praying quietly and as, I ca as you can imagine we all scarpered off as fast but as we could as, as, fa this, as fast as we one. could as fast as we could go the next morning when it was daylight you know and we were feeling much braver uh, we retraced our steps to the exact same place we found something it was like an obelisk of white or whitewashed stone on a dark concrete base and not far away there was an electricity pylon sparking <laughs> so it was making that sound but if we had not gone back yes. the next morning today I would be swearing that I saw a ghost it's basically the, these things happen mostly during what is called the hypnagogic state when either we're getting up or we're going to sleep 
because at that, at that level, there is a bit of a mix up between the subconscious and the conscious. <laughs> All right? And so, and the brain is much more susceptible to having these, uh, to building, uh, it's called staging. Actually, it happened also, there's a very, I forgot his name, there's a very famous um, example of staging. There was this um, UFO abduction help group in England. And when the, the, uh, the psychologist went up on the bus with one of his um, patients, and, so on, and suddenly, this woman went like this and started being abducted by these reptilian aliens, you know, in front of everybody. It was happening in her brain, basically. Staging, it's called. These, there isn't a coherent theory which connects them all together, but, but there are a lot of, of similarities between these phenomena. There's a lot of similarities. Also, uh, <coughs> perhaps re related to your uh, experience of being paralyzed, um, often people, uh, as they're about to go, to go sleep, find as if they're suddenly going to fall mm -hmm. and wake up starting. Uh, but um, it probably affected the uh, oh, it probably affected the motor area of the brain. That's why. Yeah, you made a point earlier about which, which I think you can extrapolate into how easy it is using technology nowadays to do people. Recently I saw something which, which is interesting, I'll, I'll repeat it as it, it was fascinating. This was like apparently on some French television, a, a kind of French James Randi. Uh, he was sitting at a table in a tent, a guy dressed in white with long hair, and people were coming in and sitting down in front of him, he would go la 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 la, speaking a bit in tongues, and then he would start telling them, you've got a red motorcycle. You live in a, in a house with two floors. Your best friend's name is Emily, and so on and so forth. And everybody would be amazed, because this guy had never seen it before. <coughs> then at one point, because this was in a tent, they showed how this was done. The, the, the wall, which was the one with fell the long down, hair, with the long with hair. Long hair. Uh, and there yeah. were about 10 people sitting on computers using Facebook, because they obviously had asked the name of the people who were coming in, <laughs> and looking them up on Facebook, and the guy had an earpiece in his, in his <laughs> ear. Fantastic, it but it shows so. how you can For do example, people John Edwards, one of the most famous um, guys, you know, who communicates with with uh, with the dead, has been um, caught many times um, of putting of, of switching on the uh, cameras and the uh, sound system um, just before the people are are you know are are told to sit down. And what happens is that the people get to talk. Mm. He gets the people in about half an hour before, okay. and he starts listening. You know, mm. to what their names are, like everything. Mm. He's got a group of people, mm. as you are saying. And, they and the skeptic society, in fact, caught mm. him. Eh? Michael Shermer caught him, actually. Mm. And there was the famous James Randi, Uri, Uri Geller. So. Um, uh, there was um, another interesting thing was that a few years ago, they actually proved that Glossolalia, speaking with tongues, actually doesn't originate in the speech center. It originates in another part of the brain, which starts to fire haphazardly, and and because today you know using electrodes and and some and some and, yeah. uh, and some holographs, you can you can pinpoint almost exactly okay which part of the brain is firing when you are doing a certain action, reading a book for example, all right, and so they 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 studied them when they're doing glossolalia, glossolalia. And they found that they, they it's it's not connected with the speech center. Hysteria probably, yeah. but they're not the sure. Outside, the outside what do they say? No. Rubbish. 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 And it's all different. It usually sounds like Latin or Greek. Yeah. yeah it's, it's all different. Repeating uh, some. It's uh, all different. Dave, what, uh, what do you think about the church's stance on miracles uh, and, and proving miracles? Well, let me one, th one thing. President, you are uh, son George Prayer. It's totally bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. How can you respect Gollum? With all respect to Chen Sutabone, how can Chen Sutabone, who was a great eye doctor, uh -huh. all right, be a credible witness? No, I'm sure he is. You know what? Consider him as an expert witness. Yeah, how can he be? This guy, you know, studied was a studied was the first guy, first layman to study Bible. Yeah, I Once I was on Shabbat, we were uh, discussing life after death, and I had uh, Anshu Psyla, who was a professor, and he said, sort of, I mean, you are not as a believer, 
And he said, listen, I agree with Wayne. I mean, between us and the cockroach, there's no difference. I mean, once we die, we both die and nothing happens. But I've been inculcated in this culture. Um, and my grandma used to tell me that once we die, we go somewhere. So now I decided to believe it. You know, even though I'm admitting there is nothing. Yeah, but that's Andrew Psyla's Yeah, Andrew Psyla. Yeah, I mean, and there's a, I, I, mean I, I would expect him I to say something like that. I think between Andrew Psyla and Chelsea yeah. you know, and they, they're sort of yeah. very susceptible to the. And, they, both of them, they but, made a career. Yeah, but, but Mike, in politics. my I mean, criticism... By sort of, you know, riding on the stuff. Yes, but That's my right. criticism is not that way. My criticism is this guy being a credible expert witness. That's the problem. How? For example... <laughs> this guy has more credibility than me, for sure. Yeah, but he's a doctor. Maybe. But what I'm saying is that, for example, even even the Lord, Lord the famous Lord, there, are, there have been only 56... Lord Willekes. Uh, 68. 68? I calculated that uh, Lord, has, Lord has been open for 150 years as you know, a shrine. You know how many hundreds of millions of people have two million, been open? Two million every doesn't, year. Doesn't that especially kind of imply that the church is very careful? That they haven't declared like 100,000 miracles in Lord? But the thing is that, that most of, even in what that happened, there was no skeptic there. Even if the forensic guy is no skeptic. Well, who was it? <laughs> who was it? She's small. What's his name? Al? The forensic guy. Al? Abel Amedici. Abel Amedici is a believer. Uh, 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 the thing is, how, one of the questions that uh, I would ask is, what, how would you define a miracle? Because to me, a miracle is something that cannot happen in a, in a natural way. If, you, if, you, if someone has a, a disease that can get better by itself or with medication, and it gets better, then Okay, Zayzer says, there's okay, the, 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 the Norman in Great Ormond Street about that, that boy who was one of the proofs of, of Don George Breca said there's only a 5% chance that he will be cured. Yeah, 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. It isn't zero. You think it's if like an M growth. Then the one goes 5%. Yeah, if you get your hands on learning how, how um, what's called miracle of, of John Mickey, he analyzes them. Mm -hmm. And first of all, Many of them come from the 1920s and 30s, yeah. when the records were so spotty that you know you can't make heads or tails out of them. Even the, the medical records, there weren't almost none available. You know, most of most of it was was based on anecdotes, it's anecdotal evidence. Secondly, what do you mean by American? For example, certain cancers are so invasive, okay, that it's impossible for them to be cured. But some have been cured spontaneously. Is it without anyone praying on them? Why? Is it because God took pity on them or because there is something special in their immune system? I'm not saying spontaneous remissions do it. No. If a, in one in a million does. That were done on the uh, power of uh, prayer, prayer influence. Yeah. I mean, like, it doesn't, it doesn't work that much. Yeah, like, I know a situation. But, if, uh, if, if, the, they, they don't they, if you're going to do it, do a test, you have to do it scientifically, which means it has to be a double-blind test. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they cannot. Yeah. When, yeah. when yeah. it is done scientifically, yeah. they're 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 not, no, 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 in they even tried it with atheists. In fact, in fact, in fact, in fact the gospel. In fact, the gospels say. The gospels say, Jesus said that the way to to recognize a true believer is that they can put their hand on the sick and they will will get better. Which but means that in his name, a true, a true, in his name. His name. So a true Christian should be able to go through the words, put his hand on every Christian, and they all get up and walk out. Emma, that is a, assumes that there are some true Christians. So. Look, so I can say, Ramon, that when Florence Nightingale started to use carbolic acid in the 1880s, and her ward had a 90% okay, survival rate, while all the other doctors wards who didn't, who, who used to, you know, were proud because they didn't put on any gloves, you know, and, you know, went like that in, in their patients, and everybody died, okay? So she's a miracle worker. She was a miracle worker. Because she used scientific, scientific means to, 
to re- and then Queen Mary, Queen Victoria came and told them, use her system or I'll cut your bloody heads off. And that's why they started using that system, because the, 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 the male physicians didn't want to, because she was, she was just a lowly nurse. And a woman. Okay. And a woman. Uh, so, no, the, these... Um, about the thing you were saying, the Haddiela. Now they really found out uh, that it's connected to the sleep apnea thing. Yes, you sleep know? apnea. Yes. It's the cutting out of the oxygen to the brain. To the brain. And um, now presumably there's the CPAP machine, where if they give it to you, um, the machine senses if you are breathing or not. Mm-hmm. It, gives you know? and it, gives you, it gives you it's oxygen. It gives you oxygen. Yes. The thing is, there's something to do with the biology of the, the person involved. And the tongue goes backwards. Usually it's because of obesity. Even obesity, yes, Usually like double chinning yes. and everything. Obesity. And a lot loud of pressure. Snoring. Yes. A lot of pressure right. on the lungs. Right. So problems with the intercostal that's muscles, right. which that's cannot right. expand. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know. And it's very, very, very common in Malta. Yes, yes. I didn't know because, because I we're was bloody fat too. Yes. We're very obese, so. Yes. Probability. Uh-huh. <laughs> probability is the probability is that on their way to Lord yes. and back, then people, then these people who are spontaneous killed. remissions are one in a million, one in a million spontaneous remissions. Mm-hmm. But this 500 million. Right? <laughs> so you should expect yes. there to have 500 actually, at least. At least. Actually, so it's less than probability. Actually, have a pretty good chance of picking up a new infection from someone else. Well, Could be um, actually. Could the brain oh, give drowning, messages so. huh? to drowning. heal itself if you truly believe? Yes, yeah, psychosomatic. Yes, psychosomatic. Yes. Yes, it happens even in that world today. If you, when I went there, people, yes, people are, you know, obviously he's got two thousand people in front of him and says, there are some of you who who have headaches. There are probably Everybody has a thousand of them who have headaches, but not you, not thousands put up their hands. Only ten or 11 out of so many people put up their hands. And some of them obviously probably took Panagos before they went there and it start wor- started working because they had a headache. Come on, how can you, if all, if 2,000 people put up their hands, yeah, I would say yeah, there is something to it. Not only that, yeah. but I don't know about this guy. I'm, I've, never, I've never seen him, but I've seen other American faith healers and so on. Uh, they put a, 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 a significant amount of pressure on the person to declare that they are feeling yes, better. Yes, of course. Like yeah. especially, I've seen them, you know, bringing up a small child. Oh, they do a lot of that, and say, Are you feeling better? Yes, of course. Yeah. And they can so, talk to so, the audience to uh-huh. say that. And there was one. Um, I think it was featured in Bill Maher's Ridiculous or or one of these other programs yeah. where there was this boy. Uh, he's blind. He's legally blind, which basically means. He can't see the difference between night and day, but his vision is so bad that he can't actually make things out. And he, the, the faith he then made it out that now he can see when actually, you know, nothing had happened. And this boy tried to wait for him after the show. Listen, it didn't work. And um, basically he, he, avo- he evaded him. And, uh, yes. yes. Uh, well, I remember Benny Hill, Hill mm-hmm. That's yeah, why, yeah, yeah. that's why, that's why I will never, I will never, um, I'm, um, you know, really dubious about him. I'm really angry at the charismatics for bringing Benny Hinn, because that guy is such a big char- charlatan. Mm. You know, the guy charlatan. who goes with a, you know, who goes for his congregation with a, with a, with a big Mercedes, that type of guy. Very you know, big. and and basically the other guy got him. What's his name? The the charismatic <coughs> leader. Ah. No, Doctor John. John. Doctor John got him. Mm. All right, and they did this big. There were thousands of people, eh? and they brought a charlatan here. Eh? In fact, I, I, I remember I had. I, read, I wrote about it in the newspaper. I wrote about it in the newspaper, you know, bringing that charlatan, and 
you know, what he did, what this guy did, because he's been disproven even, mm -hmm. even in, in, in the US. I don't know if it was Belichin, but there's a, a number of them who actually were found uh, convicted of fraud. Yes, fraud, pedophilia. No, but, but, but specifically about these uh, about these faith healing things, they actually were convicted of using fraud in the in that uh, but, thing. So look, I've been here for a while. I've been involved directly in this in this stuff. There are.